Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Welcome back to Think Tech. Mina, Marco, and me here on a Monday. And we have Marco Mangelsdorf on the telephone uh, from uh, Hilo. He's with ProVision Solar. He's a founder there. And uh, he is very Akamai about energy. Oh, wow. We have you again, Marco. So glad about that. Well, very happy Aloha Monday to you, my friend. And every other Monday just simply would not, I'll repeat that for emphasis, would not be the same without talking to you, my friend. The same. La Mem shows, you know? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know, Marco is one of the founders of HIEC, the Hawaii Island Energy Co-op Organization that uh, came into being a couple of three years ago. Um, and he follows uh, you know, the global market with regard to utilities and with regard to all the factors that enter into the, the health and success of utilities, large and, large and small, including co-ops. And one of the things that we should talk about from time to time is just how healthy our utilities are and why. What are the factors that go into uh, creating a market for their shares? Factors here, factors on the mainland, factors across the country. Um, this is, um, you know, utilities have been a huge investment vehicle over the years for investors hither and yon. Uh, they get more exciting, more complex, more interesting with renewable energy. There are more factors these days than there ever were before. And we should examine what those factors are and how those factors are affecting our local utilities as well. Am I right about that, Marco? Uh, all that and more, Jay. I mean, um, you said a mouthful and it was all right on. I mean, the, 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 the game that plays out between utility companies, uh, investor-owned utilities especially, and the investor class, as I call them, uh, the folks typically in New York and beyond that uh, look at, in a very analytical fashion, and predict where the future may, uh, may lie in terms of uh, various uh, aspects of our economy, in this case, uh, energy and utilities. I mean, it's an ongoing dynamic that uh, I certainly can't claim to be an expert on, but I've certainly learned a lot over the past years, especially in light of you know, the uh, the failed attempt of next year to purchase Hawaiian Electric Industries, which, sure. you know, we're coming up on the two-year anniversary, which was July 15, 2016, when the uh, Hawaii Public Utilities Commission announced uh, that they would not be approving that deal. So it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel like very much a newbie in all this, uh, but I, I just find it to be very fascinating because clearly Hawaiian Electric Industries, Hiko, Helco, Miko, uh, are providing power to more than 90% of the state, and the cost of power is uh, is notably high here because of a number of reasons, not least of which we're in the middle of the Pacific. So the price of energy, the availability of energy, where it comes from, from what sources, all that plays a really significant role, not just in the macro sense in terms of the state's economy, but to it pays a very significant role to those people on the lower end of the earnings spectrum who have to sometimes decide between paying a utility bill and, and paying other necessities for themselves and their families. So it's it's really pretty big deal. Yeah. Well, let's let's roll it back to before next era, which was uh, 18 months in, in in the process. Um, there were lots of arguments going on. It was a time of controversy. Uh, stakeholders and activists were taking pot shots at the Wine Electric uh, on a regular basis in every capacity and forum they could find. Um, and how did that affect you know the rating of the stock and the bonds? Uh, you know, investment vehicles for Hawaiian Electric? Well, that's a great question. I don't have a quick and easy answer to. If you look at HEI stock price over the past several years, it received a bump going into the 30 plus range uh, when the deal was announced in December of 2014, uh, the deal between Hawaiian Electric and NextEra. Uh, and it's been pretty much in the $30 plus dollar range ever since. So much to my surprise, after NextEra was told to go home and take its, its, its hundreds of millions of, and billions of dollars away, uh, much to my surprise, Hawaiian Electric stock on the New York Stock Exchange did not go down. Uh, so for the past two years, uh, the investor class has seen HEI as being uh, a reasonable uh, 
place to park money to invest in. And so uh, that's, uh, that's to the credit of Connie Lau and the board there and, uh, and a bunch of other factors that uh, the board doesn't have any control of. But for, for, you know, for, for the reality is, is uh, HEI stock and the value of the company has stayed quite stable over the past, uh, past couple, three years at least. Yeah, you know, I, uh, that's an interesting observation, and, and it's an in interesting phenomenon. I mean, you know, I would have thought at the end of that process, which was really not not pleasant or friendly, uh, uh, you know, by the stakeholders and the public, and for that matter, the press. Although I, I want to go now and tell you that ThinkTech always supported that deal, um, and at the end of the day, it was it was a blow to Hawaiian Electric not to be able to conclude that deal, and yet somehow. It came out. It came out of that 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 result um, pretty well, and you got to give them credit for that. They they found a way to not only mm, remain stable in the eyes of the community, but also to remain stable in the eyes of the investment community. What what happened there to make? Do you have any idea, Marco? What happened there to achieve that result? What did they do exactly? Oh, I don't have a good answer to that, Jay. I mean, um, as you probably are aware, there are three companies in the United States that are looked to in terms of uh, uh, credit rating, credit credit rating, and, and worthiness in terms of the paper that these various businesses hold, and uh, it's Moody's. Standard and Poor's and Fitch, and in terms of the the gravitas of the three companies, I think, you know, being a, uh, an amateur in this, it seems to me Moody's is probably first the money equals, and then you have S and P, and then Fitch, which is a smaller operation, from what I understand. So once next year was told to go away. Moody's actually downgraded HEI July 2016 from uh, their BAA1 to BAA2 grade, uh, which uh, is described as lower medium grade in terms of investment value and investment quality. Uh, that was uh, a downgrade that brought them to uh, one or actually two steps above what's known as non-investment grade or speculative, also known in, in common parlance as junk status. So for Moody's, uh, they've graded HEI, they, they downgraded them two years ago, and they're now two notches above, two notches above non-investment grade speculative or junk. S&P also downgraded a Hawaiian Electric in July 2016, again after next year was told to go away, to BBB minus. Uh, which is just one step above junk status. And then Fitch, as of January 2017, uh, has Hawaiian Electric as triple B, BBBB, uh, which they describe as lower medium grade, uh, which is uh, two steps two steps above uh, junk, which is BBB minus. So the long and the short of it is, the investor class uh, and, and these three, at least two of the three rating agencies saw the, the turndown of NextEra attempt to buy HEI as being a negative for Hawaiian Electric and, and correspondingly downgraded their credit rating worthiness. And if you look at the 10K filings that HEI filed, both 2016, uh, for 2016 and 2017, uh, they both uh, make note that if HEI's or Hawaiian Electric's commercial paper ratings were to be downgraded, HEI and Hawaiian Electric might not be able to sell commercial paper and might be required to draw on more expensive bank lines of credit or to defer capital or other expenditures. And that's a direct quote from the 10K filing for 2017. So the long and the short of it, I think, is that the raising of capital to many businesses, including Hawaiian Electric, is critical. So where does the money come from? The money comes from people paying their electric bills, which is based on what the base rate is, which Hawaiian Electric recently received base rate approvals, uh, not as high as they wanted, which caused them some grief. Uh, that's one source of revenue, clearly, and the other is lending or taking out money, getting access to commercial money on the market or from the market. And the, the cost of that money, of course, is determined, as we know, by the credit rating of, of the company. So as uh, Scott Few pointed out at The Verge a couple weeks ago in a session I attended, I mean, he made public note of the fact that one of their credit ratings uh, from S&P 
the BBB minus is one step above junk. So the folks at Hawaiian Electric are keenly aware of where they're at right now in terms of um, they need hundreds of millions of dollars for capital expenditures or CapEx for short. And the question is, where is it going to come from at what cost? And that's, that's a very, very, very big deal to, uh, to a company like Hawaiian Electric. Yeah, well, you know, it seems to me that they've done some positive things in the in the period between the uh, end of Nextera and 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 now, uh, they've done a number of um, photovoltaic projects, uh, sort of on their own, um, or at least closer to the vest, so to speak. Uh, you know, the further away it is, somehow, like like homeowners, uh, photovoltaic doesn't really help them that much. I mean, just logically, if somebody else is creating the energy the utility not creating the energy, that's not a good thing financially for the utility. So the utility has to find a way to bring that closer and be part of the creation of the renewables. Um, and you know, so you have, I think they've done some things, at least on the, you know, the um, industrial scale renewables that, that are good for them and that probably help their bottom line. Uh, on the other hand, uh, what happened in Pune with, um, you know the um, uh, the eruption and and uh, Pune Geothermal Ventures probably doesn't help them much because now they have to find other ways to generate that that power. Um, and then you know you have you have the uh, performance-based uh, docket pending right now. That's that's got to be a factor also in in the way the bottom line looks for later. And um, you know, I I wonder how those things are going to play, as well as other factors. I'm sure you're you're going to mention to me. And what I'd like to do right after the break, Marco, is to talk about the factors that are in play today and how they affect what Scott Hughes said at Verge, how they affect the ratings of all these agencies, um, and 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 what it looks like going forward, because they're our utility. And their health is kind of a reflection of our health, and we always have to remember that. If uh, there's always controversy, and there's always you know, these kind of punitive controversies that have happened in the past, at the end of the day, it hurts everyone. Uh, so uh, I wanted to ask you, what factors are in play right now on these issues, and how are they going to play out? It's not, it's not a small question. But right after this break, we're going to hear more. <clears throat> That's a tremendous, uh, uh, a tremendous uh, spine, uh, rather a tremendous cliffhanger question for you. And we'll be right, we'll right back and, and hear your answer. Wow. <laughs> My name is Stephanie Mock, and I'm one of three hosts of Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Food and Farmer series. Our other hosts are Matt Johnson and Pumai Weigert, and we talk to those who are in the fields and behind the scenes of our local food system. We talk to farmers, chefs, restaurateurs, and more to learn more about what goes into sustainable agriculture here in Hawaii. We are on at Thursdays at 4 p.m., and we hope we'll see you next time. When I was growing up, I was among the one in six American kids who struggle with hunger and hungry mornings make tired days. Grumpy days. Bleh kind of days. But with the power of breakfast, the kids in your neighborhood can think big and be more. When we're not hungry for breakfast, we're hungry for more. More ideas. More dreams. More fun. When kids aren't hungry for breakfast, they can be hungry for more. Go to hungeris.org and lend your time or your voice to make breakfast happen for kids in your neighborhood. Okay, we're back to Marco, Marco Mangelstorf, here on Mina, Marco and Me, talking about energy in Hawaii, and today talking about the utility and how all these factors affect stock price, affect their ability to borrow, and gee, that's really central, and how you, how you go forward on, on building a better grid, because that costs money and they gotta find capital for that. So all these factors, what, what factors are in play, Marco, and how are they affecting, how are they affecting the possibilities going forward? I think uh, one of the, the, to the top factor, Jay, or at least in the top two or three, has to be the perception of what the regulatory climate, the regulatory environment is in a given service territory. And here, of course, across the Hawaiian Islands, we have the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission, which now, by the way, has uh, our friend Jenny Potter, who ascended, so to speak, uh, today, in fact, took the oath of her office, uh, Lorraine Akiba, last day was last Friday. So now today is Jenny's first 
first uh, day on the job along with Jay Griffin and Chair Randy Iwase. So uh, I have, as I've said before, great confidence in all three of them to take us where we need to go and find our way through the, uh, the uncharted waters here. But interestingly, how the analysts perceive the regulatory environment plays a very, very big part. And just to, to, to quote a couple of lines here, for example, the Fitch report, the, the third of the, uh, the ratings agency in New York, uh, in their 2017, January 2017 analysis and report on Hawaiian Electric, they wrote, quote, Fitch views the regulatory construct in Hawaii as generally supportive, generally supportive of HECO's credit profile. HECO's stable earnings and cash flows reflect a revenue decoupling mechanism as well as a fuel adjustment and power purchase adjustment clause. So the takeaway from that is Fitch happens to view the regulatory environment for Hawaiian Electric as positive. A report that just came out today, in fact, from the folks at Bank of America and Merrill Lynch on Hawaiian Electric noted, quote, we perceive that there is an increasingly positive regulatory relationship from alignment in the utilities and state's goals to reach 100% renewable by 2045 helping relieve the negative pressures that have plagued the utility for many years. So here in this case, you have Fitch and you have Bank of, of America and Merrill Lynch, who both perceive that the regulatory environment is uh, at, at worst neutral and more like on the favorable side. Yeah, but so don't, you, don't you agree with that? I mean, that's, that's my observation too, that there was a time when uh, it was fairly contentious and the PUC was making remarks about HECO that were not, not friendly and Wall Street was listening. Um, but now, but now it seems like there's a certain s stability, a, a certain balance, a certain comfortable relationship, better than before, uh, where you know you can't find a lot of controversy there. It's all positive, or it seems. Don't you agree? That's my perception. Well, I think there are two two things I can respond to on that. One is the uh, the uh, performance-based regulation or performance-based rate making PBR is a very big issue. And I'll just quote here what Merrill Lynch uh, said uh, and Banco said on a, or in this document today. We perceive the metrics workshop and staff proposals as particularly key to determining the structure of PBR. We have previously viewed PBR as quote downside risk. So they are clearly taking note, as others are, that how PBR plays out is going to play a very, very big role in how Hawaiian Electric is treated by the investor class. Uh, the other thing I would mention is that in the three rate case, three recent rate cases for Hiko Helco Miko, that uh, Hawaiian Electric asked for a rate base increase of, I believe, somewhere in the six plus percent. Now we know it's always this kabuki dance where the utility asks for a rate base increase that they know, in all reality, they're not going to get. So they hit, you know, six plus or something percent or more, and then everybody looks to see to see what they actually got. Well, if you see what they actually got, and I believe for Hiko it was in the 2.3% range caused uh, the normally uh, unperturbable and almost Buddha-like, and I say that in a very positive fashion, Alan Oshima, to quote, uh, to, to say that he was, quote, extremely disappointed in that rate increase. So to what extent that rate increase approval for Hiko Helco Miko uh, is seen in a negative light by by the investor class and by the big three kind of remains to be seen. But I don't think anybody can make the case that the rate increase they got uh, was anything to jump up and down in the aisles and cheer about. So I, I think I would take a respectful um, uh, exception, perhaps, to your, your, your observation, Jay, that the, uh, the, the tide has turned uh, in terms of the way the PUC uh, treats Hawaiian Electric. I think, uh, I think they've been in for a pretty rough, rough road from my perception over the past several years, and uh, to what extent that's going to change with the new makeup of the commission, of course, remains to be seen. Well, yeah, uh, and of course you mentioned, and you should, uh, PBR, the performance-based uh, regulation, and that could go, you know, as, as that report suggested, it could be a downside factor, 
uh, and it could be an upside factor. I mean, when it came out, when it came out, uh, Hawaiian Electric said, we, we welcome that, we're, we're good with that. We'll work with the PUC on that. It was a positive statement, you know, whether you know, that it really is a, a positive experience for them remain, remains to be seen. But my question to you, and none of my questions are easy, Marco, is uh, how's that gonna play out? How are they going to play out in the short term, in the intermediate term, in the long term, as against these rating agencies, as against the value of the stock and the cost of capital? <laughs> Boy, if I had answers to that down pat, I think I'd be making a lot more money than I am now, Jay. So uh, yet again, I don't have a really good answer, but I think uh, a lot more will be known in the next uh, 12 to 18 months as the PBR plays out uh, and just kind of more exactly what Hawaiian Electric's capital needs will be and where is it going to come from at what cost. And I'll just fall back to uh, to the, uh, I think, very accurate words from the, the Moody's report uh, that dates back to the 3rd of August 2016 when it downgraded Hawaiian Electric uh, uh, rating from uh, from BAA1 to BAA2, which is a, a downgrade, right? They said, uh, quote, what could change the rating, cause it to go up? And they note, we could take a positive rating action if we believe HECO's challenges of transforming its generation base have fundamentally diminished, and if the regulatory environment becomes more credit supportive and, here's the key word, less political. What could change the rating in the downward direction? We would take a negative action should HECO encounter additional difficulties with regulators and interveners as it executes on its renewable capital spending plan and of its existing supportive regulatory provisions if they're adversely changed or scaled back. So I think in, you know, in, a, in a couple of sentences, Mooney's nailed it. And uh, the, the takeaway being, what is the, what's the climate of the regulatory environment? Yeah, and, and that's an interesting comment about less uh, political. I mean, I mean, what jumps to, to my mind when you say that is, well, Nextera was to some extent political, wasn't it? And some of the moves the PUC has made, some of the moves you know, some of these factors are political factors. Uh, for example, uh, um, David Ige, uh, um, you know, bursting out at, at uh, one, of the, one of the large conferences that uh, there would be no LNG, that he opposed LNG. Um, you know, that's, that's political, isn't it? Um, are, are we gonna be able to escape that going forward? Or are we gonna have more political surprises and more political processes like that that do affect the ability of the utility to function? I don't see, Jay, I don't see how it could be anything other than political, because energy is such an important mix of the economic, political, regulatory pie out here. I think it would be delusional to believe that it could somehow be depoliticized. And I think, you know, to quit, you know citing Ige's opposition to LNG, well, he was also, ver you know, very directly opposed to the merger of HEI and NextEra, and mm -hmm. he, of course, instructed DBED and the state planning office to take that tact as they were uh, interveners like HIEC was on that docket, in other words, to, to challenge the, uh, the merger. So um, I think Moody's is exactly right, and I think it's impossible to take politics out of energy, whether it's here, whether it's in California, whether it's in the mainland, whether it's across the globe. There's too much at stake. There's too much at stake, too much money involved. It's the lifeblood of our economy and has been for hundreds of years. That's true, but you know, you can have a political on a smaller impact and political on a larger impact. And that means that things could happen by surprise and that the impact could happen by surprise. So political has to be, honestly, a, a negative impact going forward. And we just don't know how negative it might be, but I agree with you, it will continue. It's hard to stop it. So that's a factor that is negative going forward. What other factors, what other factors are in play that could be negative? Well, uh, I had something that just happened last week, which I don't think got a whole lot of play, but I really took notice of it, and I, I have uh, reason to believe that uh, the folks at Hawaiian Electric took notice of it as well. And that is, up until recently, the cost, the, the, the variable cost of oil, which, you know, a couple years ago was as low as mid-20s, now it's in around the $70 a barrel range in the world market. As oil goes up and down, there's an effect on our utility bills, right? And that is a pass-through. In other words, 
the increase in oil cost has led to higher electric rates now compared to last year compared to two years ago. Hawaiian Electric doesn't make any money on that. It's just simply a pass-through as they pay more for oil with a one to two month lag. They pass it on to ratepayers. Okay, It's been 100% pass-through. The big deal from last week is that for the first time ever, as far as I'm aware, the Public Utilities Commission here is allowing, will allow Hawaiian Electric to only pass on 98% of the so-called energy cost adjustment charge, or ECAC for short, energy cost adjustment. Oh, well, that doesn't sound like much, right? 2%. But as a precedent, I find it to be a very big deal and an unsettling precedent from Hawaiian Electric's perspective. So they are no longer able to 100% pass through the rising cost of, of petroleum. They are instead having to eat that 2%. And from what I understand and what I read, this is the commission's attempt to continue to nudge, if not push, or come up with a different verb, if you wish, push Hawaiian Electric harder to get off of, of fossil fuels. So that cannot be seen as anything other than uh, a negative development from the perspective of, of analysts in New York in my opinion. Yeah, aside from, you know, the control point that is pushing Hawaiian Electric to um, get off oil, um, is there any logical, evidentiary kind of reason for that? I can't figure one myself. I mean, this is not, the, the, the 2% that they lose in the process is not their fault. <laughs> it has nothing to do with what they do or don't do. Um, why, why penalize them that way? Uh, I mean, aside from this, you know, this factor you mentioned of trying to force them to go faster on re renewables. Um, I don't think it can be seen as anything other than something of a stick, Jay. Yeah. Certainly not a carrot. Yeah. Certainly not a carrot. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, again, you can say, well, it's only 2%, but, I mean, it's, it's more than just symbolic. Yes, it's symbolic, but it's also tangible uh, as well. So, yeah, well, it could be 4% next time you look, or 6%, or 8%, who knows? And then it gets right. to be very painful. You know, one thing that you follow, and I see it all the time, is you're following it uh, yourself and, and you're writing about it, is uh, the, the condition of um, the solar installation industry, the condition of, um, you know, homeowner solar around the state in every county. And I wonder, you know, what this is. This is a two-part question, really. I wonder what the future of that is, because now it seems to be getting better, for reasons I don't know if I fully understand. Um, I mean, for the installers and for the increase in solar and household solar. Um, and what effect does that have, one way or the other, um, on the ability of the utility to make a buck and um, you know have have good valuations and uh, and uh, and cost of capital. Well, let me maybe address the second part of that first. So since decoupling was introduced a number of years ago, decoupling the, the profitability and return on equity of the, of the Hawaiian Electric companies, decoupling uh, from the generation of kilowatt hour sales, so that when that decoupling took place, essentially, that has meant that Hawaiian Electric is not going to be penalized, in theory, for selling less kilowatt hours as energy efficiency becomes more robust and as solar and other renewable energies come online. So I think, you know, overall in terms of from the investor class, they see more solar probably as being not necessarily a bad thing and, in fact, you know, being a positive in terms of getting to the, the Emerald City-like value of 20, you know, 100 percent renewable in power generation by 2045. Uh, you know, in terms of the overall climate for rooftop solar, I mean, we we had our worst year last year. Uh, the worst year we had in the past 10 years was last year. So from what I can see so far now that we've got six months under our belt, so to speak, uh, from across the, uh, the service territories, there has been uh, an increase for sure for Oahu. And for the Big Island, uh, I'm waiting to get numbers from my friends at the County of Maui Electrical Department to see how Q2 was in terms of PV permits for Maui County, which is Maui, uh, Lanai, and Molokai. 
So I think there's greater regulatory certainty now uh, that we've had since early this year when we know what kind of um, interconnect programs we can offer customers that are going to be around for at least the next year or two or longer. So I think there's kind of greater predictability in the, in, in, on the regulatory front. And the introduction of battery storage, uh, you know, as I've said many times, we're, we're not just uh, in theory doing it out here or looking at it. I mean, we're, we're, we've been forced to do it based on the changes that have taken place in terms of net energy metering no longer being available as of October 2015. So uh, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we bottomed out last year, and hopefully the solar coaster will uh, begin picking up, has been picking up uh, momentum mm-hmm. this year, because I think everybody is in agreement that more rooftop solar is a more better thing, and mm-hmm. especially here on this island with the loss of PGV, perhaps indefinitely, mm-hmm. uh, Hawaiian Electric is uh, and Helco are necessarily needing to look at, well, what are we going to do to make up for this uh, loss of more than 30 megawatts of, of firm power that we've had for decades? Well, and lots that, to lots to come on this. It seems to me that a few years ago, the, the, the issues on the table were relatively few and relatively simple compared to where we are now. Um, they are much more complex now, and uh, and our 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 um, aspirations are much more um, you know ambitious now. And uh, there's much more to talk about, Marco. So in two weeks' time, let's let's revisit on this all of this and keep our fingers uh, keep your fingers anyway on the pulse of what's going what, what's going on. This is a time when we have to pay more attention, not less, to what's going on in energy in Hawaii. As my dear aunt, uh, Linda Beach, used to say in response to something like that, absolute tootly. All right, there you got it. <laughs> Marco Mangelsdorf, ProVision Solar in Hilo. Thank you so much, Marco. See you in two weeks. Take care.